Welcome to my lecture on confidence intervals. Um, this encompasses chapters 7 and 8 of your textbook. And I want to get started with what's called the student T distribution. So what you're seeing here is that in the blue curve, we have the standard normal distribution. The distribution with mean 1 and var uh, with mean 0 and variance 1. Okay, so we can see that this blue curve has a higher peak than either of the T distributions, which are given in green and in red. Okay, however, the tails of the um, T distributions in green and in red have more area. That means they have higher probability. And that's what people refer to in statistics as fat-tailed probability distributions. Okay, um, So we'd say the t-distribution has a fatter tail, meaning it has bigger values for its percentiles. But one more thing to notice here with the t-distribution is it has slightly larger variability Right, if we look at this green curve, it has a lower peak and is a little more spread out. But the other thing to notice is that as the degrees of freedom increase from one to five, that is from green to red, it appears that the T distribution actually converges to a normal distribution. And that is mathematically correct, that as the degrees of freedom of the t distribution go to infinity, we get the standard normal distribution. In fact, most textbooks cut off their table for the t distribution at 100 degrees of freedom. Some do 1000, but it depends on the textbook. And that's due to the fact that there's very little difference between a t distribution with 100 degrees of freedom and one and that of the standard normal distribution. Okay. So you might ask, when do you get a t-distribution? And this is discussed in your textbook on page 266, it's theorem 8.2.1. And the answer is that you get one whenever you calculate the average, you subtract by the mean and you divide by the standard deviation over the square root of n. This right here, that is a t distribution. And that looks a lot like the central limit theorem, but there's one big difference is that we're using s here. And s is the sample standard deviation. So I'm about to go over each of these terms. This is very close to the statement of the central limit theorem, but it's a little bit different, okay? So here are those terms that appeared in the t-distribution. The most important is s, which is the sample standard deviation. And it's really important that it's s and really convenient that it's s here because s is calculated from data. n is your sample size or number of observations. Um, x bar is the sample mean and mu is the unknown population mean, okay? Um, let me just discuss one more thing here from the t-distribution. Um, this n minus one, that's referred to as the degrees of freedom. And here, this line right here is making note of that. df stands for degrees of freedom, and it's one less than your number of observations, okay? Um, one note about the t-distribution is that it was discovered by William Gausset, um, and he published under the name Student T because he wasn't allowed to publish his work because the company he worked for didn't want other companies how to know how they calculated um, their quality control. Um, and you see that that's very common in today's world with like, non-disclosure agreements, especially in tech. If you work for Google, you know, if you work for one company, you're not supposed to disclose to your competitor. It's the same idea, but he decided to do it anyway and published under a pseudonym. 
Um, one interesting fact is the company he worked for was Guinness um, Beer Company. Okay. Okay. So before I proceed, I just wanted to note um, a review of percentiles, and you can verify that the probability a t distribution is less than the value of 2.03 is 0.975. And furthermore, this middle line is very important. The probability to t distribution with 35 degrees of freedom lies between minus 2.03 and positive 2.03 is 0.95. Okay. You can use the table in your textbook or R code to calculate this value of 2.03. Okay, and here's how you do it in R is just QT. You need to feed in the percentile that you want, which is in this case is 0.975, and the degrees of freedom, which is 35. Okay. Now, here's a little example. I have a random sample of 36 unemployed individuals and I calculate the mean age is 32 years with a sample standard deviation of nine years. I wanna know a 95% confidence interval for the mean age of unemployment based on these 36 individuals, okay? So I'm going to play a game and the game that I'm playing is name the variables. Okay. Whenever you calculate a confidence interval, you'll always need to play these games. Okay. So name the variables. I named the value of the sample mean, the sample standard deviation, the sample size, the degrees of freedom, and the confidence interval is 95%. So one minus alpha is 5% and I need to calculate alpha over two. That's 2.5%, okay. Well, it turns out when I calculate a confidence interval, we knew this fact from before, okay. That is a T distribution and the probability is between minus 2.03 to plus 2.03 is 95%. Well, T distribution is nothing more than this quantity. We have a theorem that tells us that. Well, I happen to know some of the values in that theorem. I know X bar, I know S, I know square root of N. So I'm gonna plug that in here, okay? Now, the one thing I do not know is the true value of the population mean, so I'm gonna solve for it. So I begin to solve for it and I clear the denominator, okay? So let's, let's actually solve for mu. When we actually solve for mu, we're gonna get this, okay? And that's 95% or 95% probability. So a 95% confidence interval for the mean age of unemployment is given by this equation. It came right from here. Okay, so by using this theorem and the percentiles, I'm able to obtain that 95% of the time, the interval from 29 to 35 years of age contains the true population mean. So I believe that, you know, if you're to tell me, um, to ask me what is the mean age of employment, I might say 29 to 35 years of age, okay? Um, if I want to be more confident, I might change this level of confidence from 95% to maybe 99%. And that actually give me a wider um, interval for the age, okay? So it might be something like 25 to 30 that would have a higher confidence because it encompasses more possible outcomes. Okay. Now, a confidence interval shortcut, and I wanna emphasize that we did not need to know the standard deviation, unknown standard deviation. In this case, the confidence interval is merely calculated by the sample standard deviation, that's the average calculated from the data, the t-distribution with alpha over two degrees of freedom, 
uh, excuse me, with alpha over two as the level, uh, as the percentile, and n minus one degrees of freedom. So that's your degrees of freedom times s over root n. And here s is the sample standard deviation. So this is very important right here. This is how you calculate confidence interval, and I want to emphasize unknown standard deviation. Okay, so let's do an example. Find a 99% confidence interval for the mean time required for an oil change at a local company. A random sample of n equal to 30 oil changes is taken, and it's computed that the mean time to change oil is 7 Point two minutes with a sampled standard deviation of six minutes. So we're going to name the variables just as we did before. So 17.2, that's the sample average from the data. A sample standard deviation of six is given. Okay, n is 30. The degrees of freedom are n minus one, so 29. And the confidence interval is 99%. So I calculate alpha over two as half a percent. And Using the table or using R, I can calculate this corresponding percentile. Okay, that's 2.756 is the percentile. Now, if I want to calculate the confidence interval, I just plug those numbers into this formula and I'm done. So I'm going to get 17.2 plus or minus the 2.756 times 6 over root 30, which gives you a mean change time to change an oil of between 14.2 minutes and 20.2 minutes. Okay. okay. Now, here's an example that's discussed in your book in chapter seven, and this is the confidence interval with known standard deviations. You, see, you have to be given sigma is one big difference, okay? The other big difference is that this z sub alpha over two, that comes from the normal distribution, the standard normal distribution. So it says where that is related to a percentile for the standard normal distribution. And highlighted here is that we need to know the population standard deviation. Now, when you look at these formulas, they both have alpha, whether they have you, whether you know the standard deviation or you don't. So here's what's going on, is that you want alpha over two of the probability to be here. Your confidence interval has one minus alpha, and outside of that interval is another alpha over two. If you add all of this up, it adds up to 100%, because I have alpha over two plus one minus alpha plus alpha over two equals 100%. And this could be the normal distribution, or this could be the t-distribution. It works for in both of these settings. That's where this alpha comes from. Okay. So here's an example. The mean birth weight of preterm newborn babies at a local hospital is uh, 4.8 pounds in a sample of 36. Doctors believe that the standard deviation is three pounds, okay? So I want to emphasize, we're given population standard deviation here, okay? And this information from a hospital could come from records because hospitals keep records for 10, 20 years out, all in a database. They could easily compute that number and have a very good estimate on the standard deviation, or maybe the doctor just has a really good idea or a paper to cite on what the standard deviation should be. Okay, We're going to construct a 95% confidence interval um, um, for the mean weight of pre term new babies, okay? And so we're gonna play the uh, name the variables game. So we have x bar is 4.8, sigma is three, n is 36, we have the confidence level, so we calculate alpha and alpha over two, 
And then we calculate the Z sub alpha over two as minus 1.95 or an R, we can calculate it using this command, the Q norm command. Okay. If you use the Q norm command, it's gonna give you the positive 1.95. Since it's plus or minus, I don't care if you get the positive or the negative, so long as you get the same value and absolute value. Okay. So when I plug it into the formula for the shortcut, because I want the confidence interval, I just look at this equation right here, x bar plus or minus z alpha over two times sigma over root n, and I plug in that information. I plug in 4.8, I plug in the 1.95, I plug in the standard deviation, I just plug in the sample size, and I get this number, 5.77 to 3.825. And I should have these numbers reversed. And this means that the true population weight of preterm baby, babies 95% of the time lies in that interval. It doesn't mean that the mean weight is between 5.775 to 3.825. I wanna emphasize that every time you calculate a confidence interval, you're going to get a different value of X bar, a different value of your standard sample standard deviation. And because of these variations, some of these intervals may not contain the true population mean. There is one mean, one single value for the population mean of the birth weight of newborn babies, mu. It just happens that we don't know what that value is. And what we're doing here is we're taking a subset of the population, a sample of the population, to estimate that value. Some of those estimates will be rather off, but most of them will be pretty good, okay? So the larger your sample size, the better odds that you have of actually encompassing the true population mean, okay? Um, to use either of those theorems, that is the central limit theorem, or this one. Ideally, you need a sample size of n of at least 30, okay? Okay. okay. Now, one last example, since it's unlikely that you'll have to do this by hand, if you were asked to do it at your job, and most people will look at you a little bit weirdly, but um, for your exam, you do have to know how to calculate it by hand because my, unfortunately, uh, the testing center is not generous enough to allow you to use R on your test. Um, but here's how we would do it in R, okay? So we've looked at this case 1202, which is the starting salaries of males and females at a bank. And I'm gonna calculate a 95% confidence interval for the males at this bank. You, you have an R file for all the commands, but here's the one that calculates the 95% confidence interval. Okay, that's the command. This is the confidence level, and this is the data that I'm feeding in. It's called starting salary dot mail, okay? And it outputs the confidence interval. So my confidence interval says that a male starting salary will be between $5,707 and $6,205, 95% of the time. Oh, excuse me, that the, that interval, the mean will be contained in that interval 95% of the time, okay? Now, I just want to recap the confidence intervals um, for you one last time. So in summary, if you have a one minus alpha percent confidence interval, you can calculate it with this, okay? but you need to know the standard deviation. That's not so common. 
okay? If you don't know the standard deviation, well, you have data. You have to have had data to give me x bar. That's the average. And you can just use this formula. That's more common. And both of these commands, well, this command is programmed in R, and that was what's used in the command in the previous slide. Thank you for watching.